Old Testament. Um, we're going to begin um, at the beginning, and we're going to work all our way all the way to Malachi. Is that good? Is that, is that all right? Is that all right? So, so I, I'm going to be encouraging you, bring your pen, bring your notepad with you, because you're going to get a lot of stuff that you're going to be taught, and it's going to be beneficial to you. Because um, when you have an opportunity to study with somebody else, you'll be able to know how to go back um, and, to, um, and to direct them in the way that they should go. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 3 is where we'll be here on this afternoon. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are here alive. So on this afternoon, I just want to talk about why do we need to study the Old Testament? Sometimes, why do we need to study the Old Testament? Um, after all, the Old Testament, as we just read, was not a covenant that was made with us. But it was a covenant with the children of Israel at Mount Horeb, as we just read. And in fact, verse number three teaches us that not even men such as Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob were under the Old Testament. They weren't even, they weren't even a part of that. And Paul makes it clear that Christians are not under the Old Testament. He says that in Romans chapter 7, verse number 6, he said, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I, I, like, I like the way he put it. I need to read that again. I want to read that latter part. He said, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, the book of Hebrews also talks a great deal about how we are under a new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 6, it says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So he's been saying, best simply put, what I'm giving you this new covenant is better than the old covenant. Now, Jesus is the mediator of this better covenant established on the promises in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 13 tells us that this new covenant has made the old one obsolete. Once there's a new covenant that came into effect, what you need the old covenant for. So it has made that obsolete. So why should we study the Old Testament? Now, my goal is just to answer um, some simple questions. And because I'm, I don't know if you've heard this, but I've heard this before where I've went and preached at different places and they know that you are a member of the church. And I've actually heard somebody say before, oh, y'all the folk that don't believe in the Old Testament. You've heard that before. You've heard that before. Oh, y'all are, are the people that don't believe in the Old Testament. Now, I don't know how in the world that got started, but that is far from the truth. Because we don't believe in some of the good book. We believe in all of the good book. That's far from the truth. And it is true. And while it is true that a Christian is no longer under the Old Testament, that is, we do not make animal sacrifices. Or we do not follow all of the laws that are mentioned in the book of Leviticus because we are under a new law. And Christ's law, this, however, does not take away from the value that the Old Testament should have in our lives. Now, the main purpose of the Old Testament can be found in Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 24. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 24. It says, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. That explains it right there. That explains the role of it. So the purpose of the Old Testament was to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. And that brings us to our first point on why we should want to study the Old Testament. And that's Romans chapter 15 and verse number 3 says it like this. It says, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. Now, now, though Paul wrote that, that was not the first time that was ever mentioned. Because when he says that in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 3, he's simply quoting what David said in Psalm chapter 69 and verse number 9. That the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our Y'all been to Sunday school. That we, through the patience and the comfort of scriptures, might have hope. So in verse number three, Paul quotes, as I said, 
from, from Psalm chapter 69 and verse number 9, and then in verse number 4, he states those things written before were written for our learning. And those things written before were talking about the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was preserved for you and it was preserved for me so that we can learn a great deal about God and not just God, but about ourselves. Yeah. You know, the Old Testament teaches you all that you need to know about yourself. It does teach you all that you need to know about yourself. First thing that it tells you is it answers the question of who am I? Yeah. If you want to know what your identity is, you don't know who you are, it's right there in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So not only does it answer the question of who am I, but it answers the question of how was I created? You didn't originate from no monkey. Even though we act a monkey sometimes, you didn't originate from no monkey. There were not different particles that were scattered out in the galaxy out there somewhere and they all collided together and boom, you got everything that shows out. It, is. it did not happen like that. But the Old Testament lets you know how you were created. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. It says, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. And what did he do? I told you this morning. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And after God breathed on him, what happened? Man became a living soul. It also answers, why am I here? The book of Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of a man who had everything from an earthly standpoint. Yet he had nothing to look forward to if there is no God. Now, the answer to our question is found in the last two verses of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. It says, let us hear the conclusion of part of it. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What? Fear God and keep his commandment, for this is man's all. That's your whole duty. If you want to know what your job is, he gives it for you right there. He says, fear God and keep his commandments. Verse 14, for God will break, bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether that thing is good or whether it's evil. Now let's look at the three things we learn about God. Number one, God is omniscient. When I say omniscient, what do I mean? God is all knowing. He knows everything. There is nothing that goes on that God is not aware of. There is not a little bluebird out there in a tree somewhere over there across seas right now. Maybe there's bluebirds over there. But uh, there's a bird that's blue over there somewhere. And, uh, there's, and there, there's not a bird over there that could fall off of a tree and hit the ground and God don't know him. Exactly where he fell from. The intensity in which he hit the ground. God knows everything. Now, the psalmist says it like this. Psalmist in Psalm chapter 139, verses 1 through 4, it says, A psalm of David, O Lord, you search me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. I like this right here. He says, you understand my faults while they still down the street. He said, you understand my faults while they are still afar off. Then David says, you comprehend my path and my lying down and you are acquainted with all of my ways. God know who you are. He is acquainted with all of our ways. Verse number four, for there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. So before I can even conjure up what it is that I want to articulate, God, you already know the words that I'm going to use. You know where I'm going to put a period. You know where I'm going to put a, a comma. You already know what I'm going to say. First Chronicles chapter 28 and verse number 9 says, For the Lord searches all hearts, and he understands all the intents of our thoughts. That's a bad man. He know what you thinking. He don't just understand what's coming out of your mouth because God knows what's coming out of your mouth can be different than what's in your heart. So he understands the intent of our faults. And since God knows our intent of our faults and of our heart, 
we can better understand why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 5 to bring every thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ. Why do I need to do that? Because God knows what you're thinking. Now the Old Testament is letting us know that God knows our very thoughts even if we don't make them known to other people. Yes, Stuff that you never share with anybody else, God knows about them. Yes, From this we can see that God is an all-knowing God. Yeah. The psalmist says that in Psalms 147 and verse number 5, David says his, in, his understanding is infinite. It has no end. It knows no limitation. His understanding is infinite. Not only is that, but God is omnipotent. When I say God is omnipotent, God got all power. Yeah. He ain't just got some power, but he got all power. Now, anyone who has power to create the heavens, who has power to step out on nothing, all it is is darkness. And he just say, let there be light. Light just pop up out of nowhere. For him to say, let this happen and let that happen, and it happened, he even could speak to the lightning and the thunder and the roar and see and tell them, hey, sit down somewhere. And they'll roll back and they'll chill out because he said so. And all the life, we have to realize that God has all power. Job said like this, Job said in Job chapter 42 and verse number two, he said, I know that you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. That's powerful right now. Yeah. That's about no purpose of yours. Nothing that you set out to accomplish will ever fail because you are God and you have all power. He's so powerful, he can't even lie to you. He always tells the truth. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. You know, right now, just as God is in our midst, he's somewhere over in Hawaii right now out on the beach. Even though he's in our midst right now, he's somewhere over in Alaska, somewhere in Canada, somewhere. God is everywhere all at the same time. David, I like what David says in Psalms 139, beginning at verse number 7. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I go into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Now back in the text in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, I want you to notice one more reason why we should want to be in, in, included and want to know about the Old Testament. Paul says, we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's why. So that we can have some hope. When you study the Old Testament, you will learn how God deals with his people. You learn how much he loves his creation and how we, he always, not sometimes, but always keeps the promises that he makes to us. Now, our second point in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and beginning at verse number 1. He said, moreover, brother, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day and 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. 
Now all these things happen to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages shall come. Yeah. Now Paul is telling us that the Old Testament is very valuable to the Christian even today. Because we can learn from the examples of how God dealt with people in the Old Testament. And I think everybody can understand this concept because we all know that if you don't study history and its failures, you will be doomed to repeat it all over again. Now, let's take a quick look at four lessons that we can learn from these Old Testament examples. And number one, in Genesis chapter four, we learn about Cain and Abel. Y'all remember Cain and Abel, don't you? Cain made an offering that wasn't pleasing to God, but Abel made an offering that was pleasing to God. And because of this, Cain got mad and he murdered his brother. Uh -huh. And from this example, we can learn two things. Number one, God wants us to give him our best. Amen. And he does not just want us to give uh, him what is our best, but he also wants us to give him that which is acceptable unto him. Yeah, yeah. And, and number two, it can teach us that jealousy and anger towards other people can only bring about harm. Yeah, yeah. Not just harm to the other individual, but it also brings harm upon yourself. And in Cain's case, it caused him to murder his own flesh and blood, and God punished him for that. Right. Number two, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 7, we learn about Noah and the flood. And we can learn two things from this as well. Number one, God will only tolerate unrighteousness for so long. And the, the rope is only so long until you're going to run out of rope. God, God has a limit. God will only tolerate unrighteousness for so long. And God even states that he was sorry in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 6. He was sorry that he had ever made man. You know, you got to really disappoint somebody. For God to say, it, it's grieving me, it's hurting me in my heart that I even reached down in the dust and made you and fashioned you. So he destroyed everyone except Noah and his family. And number two, we can learn, well, we can learn that God will take care of those who love and obey him. What we say in the song, trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus other than to trust and obey. Our third example comes from Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, but put incense on it and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Nadab and Abihu offered a fire. But it wasn't the kind of fire that God commanded them. So they paid for it with their lives. I'm so sure glad that God tempered it came down since the Old Testament. I'm, I, I don't know about y'all, but I'm so enough glad that he deals with us in a different way. Could y'all imagine if you really just got killed the first time you got caught doing something wrong? Could you imagine? It wouldn't be nobody in here. Praise God. It would be nobody. I mean, Kennedy and Chloe would be the only ones in here. It would be, it would be nobody in here on this afternoon. But thank God that we got a new and a better way. Thank God that because Jesus died on the cross, he brought about, he ratified, he brought into effect a new covenant and now you are not killed on the basis just because you sin, but you have an opportunity to come boldly before the throne of grace where mercy can be found to help you in the time of need. So they have an value, they offer that fire. And they paid for it with their lives. And we can learn from this that God does not want us to do things our way. Amen. He wants us to do things his way. The way that he has commanded according to the scriptures. And knowing this, we ought to take God's word seriously. And we ought to do our best to worship him based on what he has commanded in the scriptures. And then number four, our example comes from Job. When you read the book of Job, you learn that Job had to exercise great patience. Yes, great. He had to exercise not just great patience, but he endured many hardships. But in the end, he received his reward 
since he persevered even in the face of the evil that he was facing. Yeah, yeah. If anybody had a reason to throw in the towel, it was Joe. Yeah. I know you're dealing with stuff, but it'll be all right tomorrow, but that, if anybody had reason to throw in the towel, it would have been Joe. But Joe did not throw in the towel. He persevered. And James uses Job as an example to teach us to be patient in suffering. Yeah. He says that in James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, he said, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. I like that right there. So, so you didn't just hear about the suffering of Job, but you saw how things ended up for Job. So, so his suffering did not last always because there was an intended end that had already been set by the Lord. And that the Lord is very compassionate and God is very merciful. God is compassionate and he's merciful toward us. Even though mercy and grace weren't around as prevalent as we know it in the Old Testament, that they were living off of the same thing that we are living off of. Because had it not been for the goodness of God, none of them would have been able to accomplish any of the things that they accomplished except God would have been. I, tell, I said it often, Moses didn't know how to get out of Egypt. They'll still be walking around today they would be waiting on Moses. But God had to give him the direction that he needed. I'm sure if Noah would have just decided to build him a ship, he'd have found him some pan. He might have found some other kind of a God said, no, I won't go for wood. I want, I want it a certain way. I want you to do it a certain way. This is how I want you to do it. This is how I want you to build it. This is how I want you to build it with. This is how I want it. This is how wide I want it. God gave him specific instructions on where it is that he is to follow. The Old Testament to a lot of people is a confusing thing. Especially when you get to the book of Leviticus and you start reading things about um, you can't stay in the house with your wife at a certain time of the month, that she got to go to another house, that you can't wear linen and wool at the same time, you can't wear two different type of fabrics, um, that you um, can't eat shellfish, I've been in trouble a long time ago, that you can't. <laughs> So praise God, you can't, that you can't do this, that you can't do that, and all of that stuff, if we look at it and think that it applies to us, we'll get confused. Yes. If we look at it and we think that that applies to us, we, we won't have an understanding, but we got to know that those things that were written in Leviticus were written for the children of Israel as God was bringing them out of Egyptian slavery and God was merely teaching them obedience. Yeah. Yeah. God was merely teaching them how to obey what it was that he had written. And they had trouble with it. Yes, Everybody that went into the, um, when they, that once started out wondering, went there when they got to the promised land. <laughs> it, 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 didn't, it didn't work out that way. God, God had cleaned some stuff out. The Old Testament was written for our learning. That we, through the study of it, through meditation on it, we might have hope. I think that I've done some of my best messages out of the Old Testament. Because you look at stories of people like, man, you can, you can take David and just preach out David by five years. <laughs> I'm for real. I'm for real. If you just go through the life, and you, I'm entirely the life and times of David. If you, just, if, you, if you just go through the life of David, man, it's some good stuff in there. What David, in, in the 49th um, division of Psalm, David said, as the deer. Pants for the water, Lord. So my soul longs after you. Man, when you really start thinking about that, that ought to do something to your spirit. You think about a deer out there running around trying to find him something to drink. That's the same way David said that my soul seeks after God. My spirit is seeking after God. I'm like a man with my head on fire. I got to find some water from somewhere. That's, that's how I'm searching for the spirit of God. You look at not only people like David, you can go to um, the people of but Moses in and of himself. If you want to learn anything about leadership, look at Moses. You want to learn anything about following God by faith, look at Moses. Look at people like Abraham. All of these stories for us, there's a blessing in each one of those stories for us. 
and there are lessons in all of that. And, and, and we don't take, just because we are not under the old covenant does not mean you don't obey things that are said in the Old Testament. Because the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill. You still not supposed to kill. Just because it's in the Old Testament don't mean that that's been done away with. You are still not to bear false witness. That's still something that we ought to follow. You should have no other God before me. It's in the Old Testament, but it's still something that we have to follow behind. So the Old Testament is beneficial for us. It's our schoolmaster that has brought us to a better understanding. So we don't just need to take the Old Testament and rip it out and throw it away. I'm, I'm, I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm following New Testament. That's true. You're a New Testament Christian. But everything that's in there is written for our benefit. Everything that is in there is written for our learning. And it can be a benefit to our life. The older, I don't know about if you, if you ever need an answer to what you're going through, go back there and read the book of Proverbs. Go, go to the book of Proverbs. If you want to learn anything about love, go to the book, The Song of Solomon. That, 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 that's, 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 that, that's the thing right there, The Song of Solomon. If you, if you ever read it, it's merely a love letter that has been written. All of the Old Testament. I'm going to show you here in these weeks to come how every single book in the Old Testament mentions Jesus in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Every book in the Old Testament. It points to the one that was to come. So the Old Testament is good. The Old Testament is beneficial for our learning. It's beneficial to help mold us to be those Christians that God has called for us to be. So we need it. We don't need to just study part of our Bible. We don't just need to study those scriptures that we like. You know, a lot of us, we love the New Testament because, oh, God is so gracious. <laughs> He is so merciful. God is so loving. He is forgiving. You don't want to go to the Old Testament where on a Sabbath day there was a man by the book of name that God had already told them don't do no work on the Sabbath. And the man was going by his way picking up sticks and God said put him to death. You don't want to read about a God like that, do you? We don't want to read about a God that even though he gave them a hundred years to get it correct, one day flooded the world and killed everybody except those that were on a boat. But he did it. We don't want to hear about a God of war, a God that would ain't go down there and wipe them folk out. Ain't go down there and do this. Ain't go down there and do that. But that is God. And we enjoying grace and mercy right now. We enjoying his love and his, his benefits that he gives us every day. But one day, that same God that's giving you grace and mercy is going to look a lot like that God of the Old Testament. Because he's going to take off grace and mercy. And he's going to put on a robe of judgment. If you ain't never been before a judge before, guess what? You're going to stand before one, one of these days. And guess what? This judge is omniscient. He know everything about you. Every secret thing, everything that we thought long done away with, God knows about it. He knows those things. And everything that is unrepentant and everything left undone will stand before us in the day of judgment that is to come. So we want to make sure that we stay as close to God as we can, as close to the word of God as we can to keep us strengthened, to keep us encouraged, especially in the day and the times that we're living in. Now, y'all know we're living in some crazy times. I was watching on the news, and as you know, the, the war, uh, semi-war that was going on between Israel and Hamas. And uh, there was an eight-year-old girl this morning that was on there. Uh, they uh, featured her on the news, how she got caught. Um, the One of the rockets hit their building, and their house collapsed. And a little eight-year-old girl is now paralyzed. Came over, and she was just sitting there on the bed crying for her mom. And it ain't nothing mama can do. The little eight-year-old girl is helpless. Caught in the crossfire of something else that was going on. And, 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 they, and they say, and, and, and they, I guess they think that what was going on was not going to affect, but you got all those innocent people yeah. caught in the crossfire of everything. And y'all know not just that, all across the world, it's stuff going on that most people don't even know about. 
All of them, you see there in Africa, how just about every week they're going into these schools and kidnapping 30 and 40 girls at a time and they're killing them and selling them into bondage and stuff like this. And we living good. We ain't got to worry about any of that. Don't have to endure any of that. Don't have to suffer any of that. And we ain't got nothing else to thank God for. We ought to thank God for those little things. That, that I ain't got to worry about. I'm not, I'm, when I come to worship God, I'm not in fear for my life. When I come to worship God, I'm not worried about anybody coming in here and arresting me simply because I want to worship God. We got a good job. And you know what? Since we got it like that, we need to take, as I said this morning, we need to take advantage of every opportunity that we have to come. Because this is something not everybody has. Everybody can't come together like this and sit down and talk about Jesus. And a lot of places that's restricted, but we have this opportunity. It's been given to us. Let's take advantage of it. Serve God to the best of our ability. Maybe there's somebody um, here on this afternoon. Maybe someone that's watching us um, via live stream. Um, you're not a, a member of the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. You have not yet had your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. You come by hearing his word, believing the same. Repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism. Have your sins washed away, done away with, never to rise before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. Maybe you're here, maybe you're online, you're standing in the need of prayer. Let us know today how it is that we can pray for you. If you're subject to the invitation, you have that opportunity now to respond as together we stand and sing the song. Of invitation. He's sweet, I know. Yes, he's sweet, I know. And you know that dark clouds there are. Will not strong wind may blow. And you know that I tell the world, I will everywhere I go. And you know that I. Oh! 